We're in the Joseloff Gallery of the Hartford Art School within the Confluence exhibition on the campus of the University of Hartford. And I have with me the Nomad MFA class of 2020 and one of their thesis advisors, Mary Mattingly. Our MFA graduates are Jared Cluck, Gina R. Fernari, Stowe Len, Leslie Sobel, and Rachel Voiner. If you're not familiar yet with the Nomad MFA, we are a present and future form of the Master of Fine Arts. Created in 2015, Nomad MFA is an accredited low residency grad program within the University of Hartford's Hartford Art School. We have a high impact field-based curriculum that includes art, ecology, study of place, traditional ecological knowledge, decoloniality, and the craft to code technology continuum. We go hyper-local during pandemic, and we go deep into the fundamental questions of our time. We do our part to dismantle destructive systems through radical creativity based in regenerative practices. Regenerative practices are rooted in love and in care. Regenerative practices are visionary and they require hard work. They help us see ourselves with fresh eyes and build new containers for our art education and community. We have been doing this for five years and we now see how the program has taken hold. We are no longer a small sprout as we have become a robust growing program. We invite you to learn more at nomadmfa.org. It's so good to see so many of you joining us through Zoom. We heralded the arrival of each one of you uh, as you were checking in. And our program today will showcase the virtual tour of the gallery, as well as a panel discussion led by Mary Mattingly. At this time, we will show you the virtual tour of the exhibition. For those of you who would like to explore the virtual space further, please note the link in the chat and you'll be able to take your time and go through that show virtually. Note that there, you will see little circles in that virtual tour. When you pause on them, you will see some live interviews and additional programming. So with that, welcome, and let's start the virtual tour.
I hope you enjoyed that. Sometimes I think we should take a little motion sickness pill beforehand. I hope nobody got busy. Dizzy. Um, I also want to let you know there was no sound with that. So if you were wondering if you were missing out on an audio component, don't worry about that. You know, I think it's just extraordinary that during the pandemic, we were able to be together during this uh, time of installing the show and putting on this um, programming. We just had a graduation ceremony earlier today. And I wanna thank the University of Hartford for all of the things they've done, including making that virtual tour um, that allowed us to do this in person and virtually. At this point, I wanna introduce Mary Mattingly. Mary is an interdisciplinary artist and the founder of Swale, an edible landscape on a barge in New York City. Her work has been exhibited in the Havana Biennale, Jorm King, and the ICP and the Brooklyn Museum, among other venues. For the last five years, she's been a thesis advisor for the Nomad MFA, and we are so thankful for her continued involvement in the program. Let's give Mary a warm welcome. Thank you, Carol, and thanks everyone again for joining us for the panel portion of this celebratory day. So just to give a run of show, we're gonna be able to hear directly from the artists about their work more in depth. I'm going to start by introducing each artist and they will spend about four to five minutes talking about their work in the exhibition and then we'll go into questions. So first to my left from Rudy, Arkansas, Jared Cluck works, lives, and draws inspiration from the Ozarks. Jared stewards chickens and gardens with care. In his work, film, and eco prints are used to document an ongoing feedback loop of observation and response. Jared has been developing an ethic of land. Jared, can you briefly discuss your work in the exhibition? Yes. I do a lot of digging. Sometimes I use a shovel. Other times I use a camera. And there's something about using both of these tools um, in tandem that allows me to point art at life and then life back at art. In doing so through observation, I find that I cannot disconnect myself from the action and from the ethics of those actions. So in doing so, I work the land with care, trying to find a deeper connection. Can you talk about the work in the exhibition? So as an example, uh, in one work, I did use the camera while I was um, working with the land and digging and gardening over the period of a year. And working with the natural clay as the seasons unfolded. And through this amount of time is when the ethics that I speak of developed and that began to lay foot for the works that come afterwards, such as a book that allows you to sit in my place and puts the actions and the responsibility back on the viewer because we're all implicated and we're all part of this. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to Gina Fernari. Gina is a painter and a process artist focused on investigations of place, community, and belonging. She lives and works in New Jersey on the edge of the Pine Barrens. Fernari has exhibited in the United States, Iceland, and Ireland. Gina, can you walk us through your exhibition, the sound, video, and the sculptural work? Sure. Um, in this show, I have a video projection onto a curtain. The video it was taken from a performance I did walking into the Atlantic Ocean, um, stopping at this level of the sand, laying down in a zone called the swash, which is where the um, waves in the sand meet and there's a turbulent area of crashing, um, and then walking into the ocean. And that video is on repeat and projected onto curtains that the guests coming into the gallery are invited to move as if they are themselves the wind and disrupt. 
um, and they're also invited to put their shadow and presence in front of the projector, um, adding themselves to this work and thinking about place and edge space and creating turbulence and um, ritualized gestures. Um, moving in from that piece, I have a series of sculptural objects that I call waveforms. They were made at the Clay College in New Jersey um, from various different clay bodies glazed there. And they're reminiscent of both the waveforms that I encounter in the landscape and some of the animal uh, exoskeletons and shells that are present in that landscape. Um, all of them are tied to the particular places that I come from, and each of the sculptures is wired for sound and is given a series of soundscapes that are tied to particular water bodies that flow through New Jersey, starting with the Atlantic Ocean and then moving into Great Egg Harbor Bay, uh, the Great Egg Harbor River, the Passaic River, uh, the Morris River, and um, they're very low sounds coming from these things, so the viewer is invited to put their ear into this shell form uh, and sort of experience a very intimate chorus of sounds um, and place themselves within this kind of displaced landscape in the gallery. Thank you, Gina. And to your left, Leslie Sobel. Leslie is driven by dual perspectives of art and science. She works in mixed media, including photography, scientific data, and painting printmaking, sculpture, and performance. Leslie gives talks and works widely to use her artistic practice to increase climate awareness and activism, including through curating exhibitions and showing her work extensively. Her practice includes working to change how we use urban land, starting with her own garden where she works to increase pollinator habitats, grow food, and native plants. Leslie's preparing to go to the Arctic Circle in 2021. Can you take us through the wall work we see behind us and also the sculptural boxes? I can. So the work that's in this exhibition focuses on two watersheds, the uh, Lake Erie watershed near me in Michigan and the Mississippi River Basin. And in both cases, looking at the intersection of agricultural runoff pollution and climate change causing big exuberant algae blooms, which are toxic. I've made pieces here which include satellite imaging and photomicroscopy, working from scales of the extremely small to the extremely large, and we're right in the middle of that. 3D work also helps bring the viewer into more intimacy with how these landscapes are impacted. And then sitting directly behind us are works responding to COVID because in this time of a pandemic, I found working alone in my studio, I couldn't help but think about how environmental injustice and pollution and injustice in responding to COVID are linked. So I looked at maps, I looked at data, I looked at how people are harmed by the pandemic as well as by where they live in other ways. And those things are indeed unfortunately linked. Can you mention the boxes? Oh yes, the boxes are found material and they include cast resin, they include some drawing elements. Uh, there's one piece, Dystopia Toolkit, which includes a crowdsourced set of little cards about how people are being impacted by COVID, and it's also a piece that invites viewers to contribute their own ideas, whether they're thinking positively as in, oh, I am learned to bake bread, or negatively, I lost my job. So it's very much a responsive piece to people's experiences of the pandemic. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, Stowe Len is a printmaker, sound, and performance artist from New York by way of Virginia and Vietnam. Len works within this culture, di cultural dichotomy by incorporating issues of place, identity, history, and the environment. Growing up in Washington, D.C., Stowe was an influenced by art and activism of the local punk scene, which he continues to embody through artwork that combines those ethics with experimental takes on traditional craft. Stowe, can you tell us about your Gomitaku installation and also the video work? Sure. Um... So 
there's an installation of monoprints called Future of a Material, or Foam for short. And Foam is, they're monoprints on canvas and fabric that are part of a long series of prints that are kind of indexing the human imprint on the natural world. These prints uh, I made primarily in the last six months, so they're infused with pandemic anxiety. I, I think that they were part of my coping mechanism for getting through the past uh, couple months. And they, they were created in a small studio, and, and what was great about installing them here was that I could finally see them unveiled for the first time. So it was a bit like unveiling books that I had written. Um, so there's a language element to them. There's a, a self-invented process that I call gomitaku, um, which I can get into later. But it's uh, essentially using trash and styrofoam specifically that I've fished out of urban waterways. And there's a lineage to this. It's connected to geotaku, which is a Japanese printmaking technique that utilizes the body of a fish as the printing block. Um, in this scenario, I'm updating the process by replacing the printing, the, the fish, with styrofoam. And so it was a deep dive into styrofoam and um, kind of the inter connections of uh, pollution and how it gets there and how it permeates our lives um, and goes relatively unseen uh, even though it's sort of everywhere all the time. So that was the inspiration for foam. I have two video pieces as well. There's a piece called Zoom Buddha which was uh, another kind of pandemic artwork inspired by all the screen time that we're all doing. But it's an interactive piece, and you can Zoom with Buddha as well as other friends in the gallery. And Buddha will be traveling next week, and you'll be able to Zoom with Buddha all over Hartford. So he's having meetings um, every day next week. And then the other video piece I have is called I Have Seen, and this was also another pandemic our project for me, I revisited footage that I shot in 2015, which was the first time I went to Vietnam to visit um, and learn more about my heritage. On that trip, I took a boat ride from uh, Saigon to the Mekong Delta and documented the boat travels and kind of put it away and I revisited it uh, during quarantine and uh, was really moved by the footage. So I kind of stitched it together with other imagery um, and wrote a kind of travelogue narrative on the screen that you can read as well. Um, so check that out. It's in, if you take the tour, you can click on the button and watch the full video uh, there, so. And finally, Rachel Weiner is a multimedia artist who focuses on ecological entanglement, decomposition, and healing. She lives and works in the mountain landscape of Western Maryland. Rachel's practice revolves around concerns of environmental devastation and the ways in which it roots. its roots are embedded in mainstream Western understanding of the more than human world. She works in rich relationship with non-human collaborators, co-creating sculptures and installations with living fungi, plants, and other members of her ecosystem. Rachel, can you tell us what's growing and dying in the exhibition? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I've got three series of sculptures and an installation um, in this show, all of which are um, composed of entirely natural materials, some living, some dying, some somewhere in between and both. Um, I've done a lot of uh, cast sculptures of human forms that are then cast in mushroom mycelium, which is the um, thread-like root part of the, of the fungi that you don't usually see. 
Um, and so as this exhibition goes on, those forms are starting to change and the fungi are fruiting and in some and in others, they're starting to break down the supplemental plaster wax and growing medium that I have um, that I've made these forms with. And yeah, all of these all of these works are working to imagine the human body as part of a larger larger ecological entanglement using uh, both life and death as tools for understanding that um, understanding ourselves as matter that is recycled and returned to the soil and part of that ecosystem part of the fungi and bacteria and plants and animals that will live after us just as we are um, so much of what has come before and yeah I'm using that kind of those kind of ideas to imagine alternative relationships that we can have with our natural world in a time of ecological crisis. Thanks Rachel. Um, I think your work is kind of a great place to start when thinking about confluence because it's so intertwined and you're, you're, you're keeping alive and these non-human forms are keeping you alive sort of symbiotically in a way. Um, I'm, this is a question for anybody. Can you talk about the title Confluence and what came together to make this exhibition happen as you're working together, what fell away? Um, give us some insight into Confluence as a title. I think if we pass the mic around, we might get five different answers. But the amazing thing about this group is every few months, it's the five of us coming together. And throughout this past two, almost three years now, we continue to come together. So in that way, I, I symbolically look at each of us as being streams that have converged into a larger river. This is confluence to me. So we all have specific focuses in our work, but they definitely, they come together in overlapping concerns about ecology, about people's place in the natural world. And as our ideas merged and flowed together, we really found that there was so much overlap and intersection that it does feel like the confluence of a river with places that come and places that separate and ideas that merge and change each other. So truly a confluence and a collaborative. And I think, uh, I think we were thinking about the nomad experience too, which is really a series of confluences in each place where we leave a little bit of ourselves and we take a little bit with us. Um, so I, I see the show as, as all of us coming together. I see the show as pieces of all our trips, our travels, our experiences. I can see it in the work, it's embedded in the work. Uh, the literal journeys and, and, you know, the also personal journeys that we all have had. So, yeah, I think it's a multi-layered confluence. And then we're living in a time of a confluence of all these crises and, and uh, that there's multi-layered ways to deal with that as well. So the title, it just made a lot of sense, I think, for right now and for us. Yeah, I... Um, I just wanted to add and sort of focus on something Leslie said, which is that we all have these overlapping influences, but we have a lot of different viewpoints and perspectives. And I think we've noticed even just in installing the show, there's repetition of projection, there's repetition of gesture, and there's repetition of a type of form or content that we're all thinking about, but in different ways. And so, um, I think for us, a confluence is that everyone's voice is able to be heard and also we're able to make something together that can communicate and be in conversation. I, 
I mean, one thing that I noticed right away in, uh, in the title was that I, I found everybody meeting or working with water. And um, I'm going to sort of use that as a segue to talk about ecology specifically, which is one of my big interests. And I know that in something I care deeply about, and I know that most everybody on the panel does as well, if not everybody. Um, so this might be a more specific question, but so many contemporary art workers ignore the material consequences of creating art. Um, where do you stand on the issue? If anybody wants to take that question. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a very, it's a, a tough thing to deal with as an artist when you are, when we're making in a time of mass making and uh, mass waste and the ways that those things affect our environment are terrible. And um, when it, we're all dealing with these environmental issues in our work and that's the content of our work, it gets a little funky because how can we justify making more things in a time where the world is overflowing with things um, even if, if our things are about said problem. So there's a balance between it, right? I think a lot of us work um, very consciously with our materials and each in a different way. So it'll be nice to see what other people have to say. But for me in particular, so much of my practice has been devoted to um, lessening and erasing my footprint personally and so everything that I use in my, in my work, with the exception of a few infrastructure details, it's all biodegradable, all will decompose within the span of a human life or shorter. And that's just something that's really important to me personally. And it makes me feel like my relationship with my ecosystem is more, gener more, more genuine and generative and um, healthy but I'm sure other people will have some things to say on that. So everything in this room we had to bring in with the exception of the air, but I, I think we'll keep it. But when you do that, and when you travel across the country with all this stuff, and try to dig it up and trace it back to the source because I want to know where things come from. Like, you could really see that chain of effect. And once we put the thing on a pedestal, that effect doesn't stop there. And even afterwards, the effect that it continues to have on us and on the environment is still very real and very palpable. So in that way, we, we have to take the responsibility of all our sources and where they come from and what that does. Anybody else want to go? <laughs> I, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, and I think, I mean, I really think that the, the art world in general needs to be more responsible. Um, artists need to be more responsible. I, we need to think about where things come from and how they're made and what we're using and why you know and we're not perfect you have to pick your battles i drove here you know i filled up a, an exxon mobile and gave them my money but it, it it was i'd rather be here than not be here so i think that there's there is a it's complicated but it's important to to be mindful of what you're using and and how and why and what the alternatives are yeah, I, just, I think from my opinion, I, I just um, want to point out that as humans were, and as artists, we're full of contradictions, but that shouldn't stop us from doing the work that we need to do in the world, and how, how we work that out is individual. Um, I want to ask people who have, this could be, a, this is an open question as well, but it's directed to a few of you in particular who have solitary art practices primarily. So your work embodies a studio practice, but you might be collaborating with non-humans, um, living or manufactured. How has that work kind of changed your perspective as an artist? How has it changed your perspective as an artist to work in this cohort as a group? 
and collaborate. So I think I'm, I have sort of a dual practice pretty consistently. It's alternately solitary um, spent walking or being in the studio and then with pockets of collaboration at artist residencies and in this situation, which has been um, really amazing. And I think the thing I get differently from each one is that Personally, the solitary is more meditative. It's more about me and my journey of learning something. And when I'm in a collaboration with other people, it's a different type of work. It's a give and take with other minds and other processes and other backgrounds and experience. And um, this one in particular has been extremely fulfilling and I'm really grateful for it. Um, it's a unique thing to become extremely close with people over this long a period of time who I only get to see for two week chunks every few months. Um, and then to communicate with them via text message, um, to keep in touch, but then just very intensely, we've lived together, we've cooked together, we've camped on the side of a butte together. <laughs> it's been amazing. And amidst coronavirus. <laughs> um, and uh, on coronavirus, uh, I'm curious, maybe Leslie, can you um, talk about your work with coronavirus and um, yeah, I guess maybe where it's going. I'm not sure where it's going, but uh, I, in the course of all this, I was looking at work, making work that's not in this show about the impact of coronavirus on Detroit, looking specifically at mapping their and hotspots for the virus and hotspots for poverty and environmental injustice all overlap. And in this piece here, there's much of that kind of thing across the greater Midwest. So on the one hand, I find myself mapping disparate items that you might not scientifically put together, but when you start looking at them in terms of demographics, in terms of geography, in terms of emotional impact, and in terms of the land, they coalesce. So I expect to keep doing more of that as I go forward and as we hopefully eventually emerge from this pandemic and uh, start to be able to work together in person in a freer way than we are right now, when it's such a straightened, complicated, screen-based existence. Yeah, no kidding. I think your work, because it goes between the representative and the active, also um, really demands that in-person space. Yes, it's, it's, it's hard to make work that's place-based, that's entirely technologically mediated. It feels like it's too removed from one's emotion, from one's connection at that point. And yet, right now, my ability to go out and do that kind of field-based work is limited. The last field trip I did to Toledo to shoot algae bloom and uh, impacted environmental things was just at the beginning of the shutdown. And places were starting to be ghost towns, starting to be hard to go places. I haven't tried to go back since. It's only about an hour from where I live, but it felt like a time where even just being on the street was inappropriate. So I'm working with the imagery I have and waiting for things to open up enough to feel like it's respectful even to go back out and talk to people and photograph and be there and take water samples. And the scientist I work with is also in that situation. So it, it's just, it's a strange time to, if it's all technologically mediated, it's too much at arm's length and that lacks the connection that makes it meaningful to myself and I think to viewers as well. I agree. That is, that is a hard reality. Um, Jared, I've always wanted to ask you this question. Um, Jared, there is an undercurrent of spirituality in your work. Can you talk about uh, how spirituality might play a role? Can I? Will you? <laughs> Is it possible? May you? I'll give it a shot. <laughs> so it's a hard one. 
Um, first of all, philosophy is a big part of my practice. I spend a lot of time in a dark room staring at what would be the wall. And there's a certain limit to reason that does not catch the breadth of experience. The works of Martin Heidegger and his phenomenology allow us to gain knowledge from other parts of experience that go beyond reason. I don't know what word I would put on that, but I've found areas that come through the work that I could simply describe as further or beyond me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, direct question for you, so uh, can you describe inventing Gomitaku? Mm. Yes. Um, well, I think, you know, I would have to start with my water journey. And so for, for, for me, uh, living in New York City, which is, you know, essentially a chain of islands, I found myself uh, going to the water to find escape and to find uh, solace in the midst of the chaotic city. Uh, in spending lots of time down by the water, um, I began to also work with water in my art practice. And so uh, I've always loved printmaking. Never been a great printmaker, though. Like etching, you know, silk screening, uh, not so great. I, I don't know. I, I loved it. I couldn't do it. But when I discovered Suminigashi, which is a floating ink water printmaking process, I was like, finally, I found a way I could work. Uh, and at the heart of that is a collaboration with water uh, as not only a material, but as a, an actual collaborator, you know. And I think in discovering that, I have gone on a journey of collaborating with bodies of water, with rivers. Um, and in that journey, uh, I had begun to fish out uh, the detritus that I have been accumulating uh, in these urban waterways, not knowing what to do with it. And I had bags of styrofoam. A lot of styrofoam ends up floating and washing up onto shore. Uh, and then in collecting all of this stuff, uh, I began to all of a sudden be a caretaker of these objects that I didn't necessarily want to have, but I felt obliged to get them. And, you know, uh, how does one care, caretake? You know, I began to touch them, look at them, and eventually print them. Um, and so, Gomitaku means trash impression. Uh, it's a sort of a made up Japanese word. Uh, I asked a Japanese printmaker friend of mine is it okay that I say gomitaku, you know, can I invent that? And she said, you've been talking about this for so long. It, uh, it's real to me. You, you said it, you know, you made it. It's real. Just shut up and use it. So I was like, okay. Uh, so gomitaku it is. Um, but there's something about inventing words that I love and kind of creating uh, kind of uh, adaptations of, existing art practices. Um, so Gomitaku comes from Giyotaku, which I was talking about earlier, the fish impression. And I like the idea of connecting through history to a fisherman printing his, his daily catch to me catching some horrible you know, piece of plastic, inking it uh, with the same loving, tender care. Um, to kind of, you know, create something else that can speak to all of that, so. And you made up another word, foam? I like to make up words. <laughs> foam, I love acronyms too. And so foam uh, is future of a material. And so I always think, 
you know, titles, like I work in a lot of abstract languages, visually abstract, sonic abstract languages. So a title is really important to me. It's, it's sort of like, you'll never see me have an untitled title. Uh, it's like, it's a chance to give the audience a clue. So, you know, if the audience comes in and they think future of a material foam and they leave and, and that's all they got, then I'm still happy, you know? So it's like planting new meanings for words. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. I'll never think about foam in a, the same way again. Oh, good. Um, Gina, I, this is a broad question, but I think you might talk about home. Um, what are the questions that drive you? It is a broad question. <laughs> and why? <laughs> um, I don't know if I have like verbal thought through questions. Everything is a question. Um, every space I encounter is a question. <laughs> every sound, every person. Um, I think for my work lately, it has definitely been about home and finding out what I think I've been searching for the things that have made home that other people have very consciously constructed for me in the past, the communities that have been built around me, the schools, um, the ecosystems, and then being at this phase in my life and sort of taking on that responsibility of being the next generation to start to shape those things consciously. I really want to know and identify those skill sets that people used before me and um, maybe the things I wasn't paying attention to before I'm, I'm searching for them because um, I know it's been an act of caring and that finding my way to what my active cares are going to be and where I belong in that system is really important to me. How would you ask us to look at the place we're from maybe differently or through additional lens? I think I would start with drawing. I would ask, um, I mean, all of you are artists, so you already do this, but I, I think generally sitting still someplace and having some kind of mediating thing, whether you're writing about it or um, just listening and looking consciously. Um, for me, it's often drawing and painting or taking field recordings. Um, creating memory with purpose in your mind, I think is what I would ask people to do. And when you do that, it opens up an opportunity to notice things that you might not see if you have an agenda in your day. So to ask a space to tell you what you might not see normally. That's great, thank you. Um, we're gonna open up for questions in a minute, but I wanted to take just one minute to ask if, there's, if there were any questions that somebody didn't get a chance to answer that they really wanted to, and if not, I have one more question. Well, so this is a statement that could lead to a question. Um, Philosopher Eduardo Galliano said, let's save pessimism for better times. Can anybody respond to that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll respond to that. And I, I think it's, this is an overwhelmingly terrible time in so many ways. Wildfires, hurricanes, government, econ economic and environmental collapse. And yet, it is the time when it is most important for us to get up on our hind legs and respond to it and not indulge in the thing that I know I want to do very often, which is curl up under my covers and pretend it's not happening. It's, it's a really hard time we're facing, but I think it's a particularly important time as artists, as activists, as citizens to get up and try to work to improve things because it's sure not going to happen if we don't. And people who are knowledgeable about these issues, people who care about these issues passionately, and that's certainly the five of us and really everybody in this room and probably everybody on this Zoom call cares. And 
So pessimism as a state of mind seems to me to be a legitimate state of affairs, but pessimism as an approach to how you deal with it is an indulgence we can't afford right now. We, we, if, we, if we don't try hard, work hard, nobody else is going to do it. So we all, you know, everybody in the country, everybody in the world who's in a position to, to work on these issues needs to be, I would say. Thanks, Leslie. And uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in to listen to a little bit more about these five really important artists. And please also tune in next week when they go into more detail about their work. And now we'll open it up for questions. All right, yeah. So should I repeat that question? How has the pandemic or not affected your practice? Um, it's been, it's, it's drawn me into it a little bit more because we are right now living in a moment of mass death um, sparked by this pandemic and also by, you know, political situations and, and all of the horrible things that are happening in the hellscape that 2020 is. Um, and, you know, a lot of my, my work is about death and about how death can be a productive step in a cycle of regeneration. Um, and it's really hard for me to, to come to terms with that right now um, as, as it's all around us everywhere. And so it's been kind of difficult for me to keep going with this body of work in this time, but also increasingly important for me. And especially like to, to see like, yes, things are bad now. Um, and everybody is struggling. Everybody's losing people. But that's not to say that all hope is lost. And it's not to say that nothing good can come. And, and we've already seen like some really wonderful things coming from this pandemic and the way that we've all been able to connect and to come together for this show has been a blessing. And in, in some sense, it's again, just that horrible situation that sparks new life. And I think that's, that's important, especially, yeah, I think that, and that aligns with that last question about pessimism and yeah I think we're using our art practices as a way of moving forward and moving through all of this and I should I certainly am So question to everybody, how do you plan to move forward from here as a cohort, individually? We're probably going to keep bullying each other through WhatsApp in our group chat. <laughs> no, but I, and I'll, I'll let you all speak too, but I, we've come together in a very special way as a cohort. Um, I like from the second that we started this program and we all showed up at that campsite in Rhinebeck and we're like, where are we? What are we doing? What's, what's happening? Who are you? And we, we bonded right away and we've been through so much together and we've like, like others have said, living together, eating together, camping together, um, traveling together, seeing all of these wonders together and going through all of these talking about really tough topics and we've seen each other laugh and cry and all of that and we've become kind of a family um and I think it it shows it shows in the work um and so I don't think it would be possible for us to move forward from this without each other 
Um, and I certainly don't think other, any of us would want to. So we're all, we're all keep making plans for collaborations and keeping in touch and visiting each other, doing residencies together. We all are, are hoping to um, join in more, more confluences in the future, if you will. So just to rephrase, what about incorporating a virtual experience and the process of it surprised you? Uh, I think it surprised me how grateful I was to be able to connect with so many people beyond this location. Um, for a long time, I was very centered on figuring out how to install for this space and how to communicate with the student body and who would be here when we exhibited. And the level of resources that were poured into this exhibition and to create translations of it for the web and into the catalog and now into this 3D rendering that's able to be shared with videos. I think the layers and the the deeper meanings of the work that are able to come through as it gets translated into all these places was really interesting for me. And I'm excited to see how it reads um, for all of you. <laughs> Yeah, we started thinking about this exhibition at a point where we weren't sure it was going to happen in a real space at all. And so the fact that it was able to be physically installed together was a gift. But it's been expansive, I think, to make it virtual in so many ways and find more ways to reach people and more ways to use those tools to make it more accessible. And I know myself, I think we're all very grateful for the amount of support we've had to do that, but also amazed at the tools there are that make it more possible. And it makes me wonder, going forward, how collaboration and exhibitions will change even post-COVID, because the, the ability to collaborate effectively online and in this kind of liminal in-between space is, is profound. And of course, it's also better for the planet if one doesn't have to travel all the time to collaborate. So I'm not sure where it goes after this, but it's gonna be interesting for sure. So, what are the most critical environmental issues that you're concerned with, and how does traditional ecological knowledge play into your work? I'll tackle starting on that one. Um, I, the more I learn about traditional indigenous knowledge, the more convinced I am that scientists think they're reinventing the wheel that uh, indigenous people had figured out a long time earlier. So let's start with talking about forests. Forests in this continent have been managed by indigenous people for useful harvest for millennia. And now we're looking at terrible fires because modern forest management techniques are far less effective than indigenous ones. Combine that with climate change and we've got an unspeakable disaster on our hands. So th there's a level of respect and openness required to learn what those indigenous uh, knowledges were about land and how we relate to it. And the more we learn as white 21st century people to go learn what people who were here for a long time before us knew and know and how they responded to the land, 
the better off we are. And it, it takes a degree of humility. I don't think it supersedes and replaces science. I think it complements it. And you combine those knowledge systems and you're stronger than by saying one is better than the other. They're both powerful. But the indigenous knowledge needs to be accorded a good deal more respect than it traditionally recently has been. So I'm glad to see that starting to change. Um, I think in terms of the most vital ecological issue, New Jersey's ecological landscape is extremely complicated. Um, and there's been industry for at least 400 years in terms of like from turpentine production to um, glass production. So there's not a lot of what some might call a pristine landscape. Um, so the most important issue to me is really how all of these people are living in this space together and how we're all sort of, our mixing agendas are impacting the ecology of these spaces um, and how you find some semblance of balance or recovery um, within that environment is really interesting to me. There's not like one solution that fits this place that I live in. <laughs> um, for indigenous knowledge too, I think it's important to me to know that and to keep reminding myself and the people around me that there are those who live in this space who've been there for 10,000 years and that they have a ton of knowledge about how the land there and the ecosystem there works, um, but also to respect that they don't have to tell me what that is. <laughs> um, and I think that listening to people is the most important thing for me. I can keep going. I'm almost going to agree with you, Gina. <laughs> so <laughs> when we were uh, in New Mexico working with um, Roxanne Swinzel and Porter Swinzel, the ancient Pueblo, the first night I had the joy of being in the dark again but as it started to get dark, they told us to just sit and to listen and that it would get cold and that we might not be used to this or that we might not be used to the dark. And over that period of time, as we're digging the dirt and engaging with it, then a certain awareness does come with that knowledge. And first of all, it's a great honor to receive that. But a big portion of it comes from the land itself. So to answer the second question about environmental awareness or what impact or what would then be the most prescient, perhaps the thing to do would be to go outside and sit until it gets dark and cold and be there with it. And then the land will tell you. How did the places you visited influence influence your thinking and your work and how did the MFA structure help that in traveling from place to place? Was that <laughs> I think um, you know at the heart of, of this program, which is different than almost any other program as far as I know is that we are traveling and I think to learn to be a good traveler and to travel as an artist um, with respect and humbleness um, 
you know, was, was such a part of the ethos. Um, and so our experiences traveling were not tourist experiences. You know, they were pretty much from day one, we would be embedded into the place. Uh, and, you know, we had the privilege of going on a Bedote memory walk that just situates you in the place and its history and acknowledging the indigenous knowledge. And so that has a huge impact on you as a person, on anyone, but then as highly sensitive, curious artists, I think that we all were able to absorb the magic of each place uh, in a way that, you know, a lot of other people wouldn't normally be able to. So having access uh, through the program gave us a whole new way of, of being a traveler and, and learning how to do that. And those are planting seeds, you know. Um, I'm going to go back to New Mexico next year. I'm, I'm going to go back to all those places. I'm sure we all will. So you're planting seeds and, and you're going back to, uh, to tend to them um, in those relationships. So it had a huge impact. And I think, uh, you know, that's kind of the best, best way to do an MFA. Can you talk about how emotion surprised you while you were creating these pieces? Yeah, I've got some pieces in this that unexpectedly sparked some really heavy emotions for me. Um, and particularly the death masks pieces the first one, I, I got this idea to, to create these death masks that decompose because death masks have been used as a way to preserve the faces of important figures um, throughout history. And I like the idea of, of breaking that down and, you know, dissembling the human legacy and replacing it with other life rather than a static plaster figure. So I went and I, you know, got all of my plaster supplies and I started slapping this stuff on my own face. And, um, and like, it's, it's a harmless process. It's easy to do. But the second that I got my eyes and my mouth covered and I, I was like overwhelmed with panic and I realized like how, scary it is to like find yourself in a place where you can't see you can't speak you don't have agency um but each time i did it it was less and less scary and by the last ones i'd be like just dancing around my bathroom um listening to music or something and i felt so comfortable in this moment of of quiet and and where where myself was not necessarily able to able to express i guess and yeah the way that i i learned to be in that process of making was really important and not something i've talked about very much wow that was really enlightening <laughs> anybody else have Anything they want to add? Yeah. I made a print of eggs at various stages of development by shining the light on them. So rather like I was talking earlier about other forms of knowledge that at this point that the observation formed much of the knowledge. But I would think that the, uh, the feeling or what then comes with that also alludes to another type of knowledge. 
when I got to the end of the process and they hatched, there were no words or reasons. So all I could do then to explain that is use the tool of art in the same way that I'm using to understand it. And the feeling, the heart, it comes from there. How has the purpose of art changed for you over time? I don't know if the purpose of art has changed very much for me, but the, the avenue I would like to focus on for my own artwork and where I want it to exist has changed. I think I, when I was a young art school undergrad, I wanted to be in museums and um, you, I had this in, impression of the MoMA and the Met and this idea of being um, put in the history books. And right now, and especially with this program, I'm much more interested in making art of my place and of sharing those stories and building new stories with people in my place and also getting to meet people in their place. And that's what this program has been about. When we've been embedded, we've been welcomed into homes, not just galleries. Um, and I think the stories that are able to be told and the depth of knowledge that's able to be shared and the common language that begins to be developed is really interesting and valuable. Um, and I think that my focus is definitely more on the people around me than any type of like, I'm gonna be a big person someday. <laughs> I think I feel more urgency, more, more intensity of what it is. I've, I've been making art for a very long time and the clarity of what and why and why it matters is distilled, partly by the program, partly by the world, partly by my age. Time, time is fleeting, but uh, yeah, what well, one's purpose is is perhaps more interior and more more driven. But uh, I definitely feel impelled at this point in a way that maybe I didn't when my children were small and I was juggling other things. So yeah. Yeah, I think I've had a a bit of a shift throughout the course of this program in, in what making meant to me. And I think when I started, for me, art was about making a statement. It was about telling somebody something. Um, and now it's more about making sense. Um, and I think maybe that's, that comes from shifting from an object-based practice to a process-based process practice. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I've, maybe it's, it's something in the way that this program values experiential learning so much. It has kind of turned me on to what I can learn in, in the experience of making and not just the, 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 the final result, I guess. Um, so it's, but yeah, it's been a huge change for me and I've, I've learned how to process different kinds of knowledge from, from these experiences, from these other beings that I'm working with. And yeah, it's, it's been quite a shift. I really didn't have an answer for this, <laughs> but the work has definitely changed. 
I think kind of going from what Rachel was saying, like to steal from that first about making to making sense. And there was another quote that I forget who it was about instead of making things, but making things happen. And then even just now, maybe was, maybe you, uh, you were a little more right than I thought, you know, that, that the people have started to become more important. And especially in the past few months. And when we put this show up, people hadn't seen art in a while, like physically, and we need it. And now that I have this knowledge and this obligation, like, we have to bring it. And it really matters. And it's really meaningful. And this is our job. Can you share a memory of a, 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 a magical or a serendipitous moment from the program? It was when we were laying next to the water, Emily, and listening to it. Water again, riding on the airboat in the Everglades with Houston, feeling the shimmer, the just surrounded by light, sky, water, plants, huge seabirds. It was just the most extraordinary liminal floating experience. I can't wait to go back. I think one of the most magical moments for me was being at the top of a mesa with two buckets of clay in hand and seeing a beautiful patch of bright orange um, and Carol and I took off our shoes and our socks and started piling this beautiful red clay into our socks and threw our hiking boots down back back on um, to go down the mountain and showed up carrying you know these nasty sweaty socks that we've been camping in for days at a time and um, and being able to then work with that and transform it into something and to hear it speak with our hands, that was, that was magic to me. So in a traditional MFA, you might leave somewhere for a couple of years and study and then maybe return home. But in this MFA, you're coming and going from home to places together. So you're traveling together and then you're returning home. How has that process potentially influenced your connection with your home and with other places and each other? So um, when we were in New Mexico, Porter Swensel was talking about how every mile in an area has essentially a different vibe, a different place. There's different characteristics about it. Um, and what works for that little patch in that little section of earth is different than what will work a mile down the road and your language might change. And I think we've been to a lot of places and we've been invited into a lot of communities and for me to see all of these different strategies and to find the connection points to where everyone has a way of moving through their place and listening to their place and kind of breaking their own habits or their own everyday structures in order to take a moment and really look at it and see what it needs um, and tend for it. And I think there are connection points between all these places, not in exactly what they had to do to listen, but in the act of wanting to. Um, and then being able to take that back home and to say like, okay, so 
I don't live in the Everglades and I don't live on the side of a butte and I, I don't live in Minnesota, but I can shift my viewpoint enough today to do a transect walk like we did with Francia and give myself two points to walk between. I can use the strategy in the process that she was using, even though it's a different place that I'm living in. Um, and I can then adapt that strategy as the landscape tells me two points might not work here. There's a lot of water. <laughs> you might need three or four, <laughs> or you might need a boat. Um, and I think that the program really, it teaches that adaptability, <laughs> which is really great. So many tools, so many reference, so many connections with different kinds of places that, yeah, then you take home and say, I'm here. What, how do, my place is special to me. Why and how? And what have I learned about these other places and peoples that makes me more deeply rooted and gives me other ways of coming into relation with my own place? When I started working as an artist, making work about other places, I kept thinking the Midwest where I live isn't very exotic. It's not very interesting. But the and I've lived there for most of my life. And I find a deeper love, a deeper understanding of the ecology, the geology. We're so shaped by the glaciers. Uh, and all of those things, understanding them more, gives me more to make work about and more love to make that work with. So yeah, it was formative and profound, actually. Yeah, I'd like to kind of repeat what you two have just said in the metaphor. Um, I, I've always, since the first residency of this program, kind of likened it to building a web. Um, I see myself as a little spider trying to build my home, build my understanding of my belonging in my place and my world. And each time I go to a new place, I run out there with my little string and tack it down in a place that is important, that has value, and, um, and that I can learn, learn from. And then, you know, so every time we travel, I, I get these, there's just a wealth of knowledge in everybody that we meet and it's so intense and we meet these amazing, amazing people and amazing, amazing places. And I come home carrying all of that with me. And with each little connection that I make away from home, my strength in the middle of my web, my place in my middle of the web is more secure um, and, and more beautiful. And I learn how to see my own my own place so much more deeply. Um, yeah, I don't know if that made sense. I hope it did. <laughs> share um, I'll just rephrase that can you share can you talk about your interpersonal relationships as a team is it okay to ask who specifically asked that question <laughs> sure okay well Jerry you're safe I can't say the same for Leslie though uh, speaking of this interpersonal relationship we uh we give each other a lot of hard time, but we've also been back and forth across the country a couple times. So this dynamic and the push and pull between us, and I don't know if you'd call it balance because sometimes it's lopsided and it rolls, but like we make it work and we've become family. So I don't think there's any better way I could describe it than that. with whom you interact on 
your various business. What did they think about the artist status and how did that change over the course of the different residents? Well, you're dealing with both. Okay, there's a, the question was how are the communities uh, looking at a bunch of weirdos when we come in? And uh, the Im immediate people we're working closely with are often artists and certainly people who know what they're getting into in hosting us and working with us. And uh, really, we come to them trying to be as open and receptive and learning from them as we can be. So. And Jared's and my constant abuse of each other is not something that necessarily is inflicted on the community members. But uh, generally, I think people are very welcoming and very interested in how are artists from somewhere else coming and looking at them? What, what do they have that we come and look at and say, this is really beautiful, this is really powerful, this is really interesting? People like to have other people be interested in and receptive to what they do that's amazing. I think we have been incredibly generously welcomed with all of the communities we work with. I know we've all made really deep, lasting, important to all of us relationships with people we've worked with. I know we all talk to many of those folks often and profoundly, and I'm so grateful for those connections myself. They've, they've been life-changing, truly. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Thank you to all of you who came to listen to us talk about our work and share it. I'm so grateful that you were all interested in doing so. That's great. Yeah, thanks for coming to the coolest, weirdest uh, <laughs> thesis show. I'm glad that you could see it and hear from us. And thank you all for supporting us in every single step along the way through all of this. It's been tough for a lot of you especially when we up and disappear for weeks at a time and none of us could have made this happen without you so we all we love you all <laughs> ah that was beautiful thank you thank you for all the different facets of your work and of your experiences that you shared and i want to thank the audience for such great questions uh, this concludes our virtual opening, but I want to remind you that next week on Wednesday night and on Thursday night, starting at 6 o'clock Eastern Time, there will be individual artist talks. And we're hoping to organize it so that those will be unmasked artist talks. <laughs> and so uh, we're trying to do that in a way that will be safe for everybody. Um, you'll find the details on the links for that event at nomadconfluence.com. And you'll also find um, information about our program at nomadmfa.org. So with that, have a good evening. Stay safe. And thank you again for joining us. Bye. Bye. Thank you.